is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Unsold, Cradle Book One, chapters five, six, seven, and eight. In these chapters, Lyndon goes up against somebody way more powerful than him, and he kind of wins, even though he doesn't. And that is embarrassing for the other guy. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Andrew for commissioning this episode. Andrew is in the chat. So is Jean Marie. Hi, Jean Marie. Um, Y'all, these chapters are full of some stuff that I don't know what to make of. And it's sort of sandwiched in the middle. So I won't talk about that off the top. But I confess, I do not know what's happening there. And I... I am comforted by the concept that I am not meant to know that it is all meant to be kind of figured out as we go along. So I'm um, giving the author some trust and just letting myself ride that wave. Um, I will admit that my patience doesn't last forever. So I hope that the author within the next couple episodes manages to get me on board with whatever it is that's happening here. But I have my theories, I have my, you know, associations and references in my mind for things that this reminds me of. And we shall see if any of that, like, resembles anything like the truth. But that remains to be seen. So, chapter five begins with, while it violated clan decree for Lyndon to follow a path, it was technically allowed for him to study technique manuals. After all, he couldn't actually use the techniques without Madra of a compatible aspect, which he couldn't harvest. So that is the first time I think that we really get a cause and effect sort of description here of what it means to be on a path and what it means to uh, be able to pull Madra from your surroundings. Um, It is an interesting idea that his father mentions a little bit later about like, you know, having a being like, he talks about how there are um, people who are fire artists or sword artists. Um, And I am assuming that that is linked with like the compatible aspect part of how this works. But it is still a little bit fuzzy to me. Um, And a reminder, in the last episode, it ended with him finding a book called Heart of Twin Stars. And this chapter begins with him reading it. And it's written in an interesting way. It's written as a journal entry more than an instruction. Um, At least the part that we get to read. Because I think that there's a discussion of the technique a little bit, like, that's a little bit further. But I felt a little bit bad for Lyndon here because Lyndon clearly found this manual that said, you know, that you could have no particular uh, focus and no particular path and still be able to do this, you know, use this technique. So Lyndon sees this and really thinks like this is going to be it for him. He's going to have it figured out and there will be some weapon in his arsenal that he'll finally be able to use. And we find out later that is true. He is able to use this, but it's not what he thought. I think he expected there to be a real answer here. And instead, it's actually him reading between the lines that gets him the next step along this path that he is forging for himself. Um, 
So it's written with this tone, and I love I love reading stuff that's written this way, where you really get a sense of a person, even though you can tell they don't realize what they are revealing about themselves as they write it. Do you know what this reminded me of? Reading this journal entry reminded me of reading a Yelp review from a really shitty person who thinks they're making a business look bad when they write the thing. But really, they are letting you see they are an asshole, impossible to please, and just generally kind of a dick. And like, I love finding reviews like that because people can completely crush a uh, business like by leaving one star reviews. But if you really learn how to read them, you can start to read between the lines and realize that maybe this business isn't doesn't deserve that one star here. And this dude comes out of the gate and is immediately like, I'm only writing this down because I have to. The dude who used this against me is a total dick. I'm not even going to say his name. He doesn't even deserve it. And beside the fact that I am only telling people how to do this in case, God forbid, he hands down the knowledge on how to use this technique to somebody else, which would be really terrible. And he is on the only person I've ever met who is low enough to do something like this and shady enough to do something like this. So I'm letting you all know in case how to defend against this, but hopefully you'll never meet anybody who's as big a dick as this guy. And honestly, it is very entertaining. I very much enjoy this. And and he even says something about how um he and this man have gone up against each other. And I say he, I'm assuming that the way this is written, it feels like a guy. But he says something like, we've gone up against each other a bunch of times, and I've always been able to defeat him. And it was never even a challenge. And then he's like, but there was this one thing that he could do. Um, and this is where the the question really comes into play for Lyndon, where he has to like figure out what is useful from this little entry that he can use. Um, the theory is behind empty palm, which is this technique. He focuses neutral madra into a simple palm thrust. How he cancels out the aspects of his spirit, I have not yet deduced, but the result is undeniable. When his empty palm makes contact with my core, his madra disrupts my own. For a few seconds, I am as powerless as a wretched unsold. Even more so, perhaps, as I can hardly muster the energy to control my own limbs. I tried a series of techniques to defeat him, but each time he managed to land a single empty palm upon my core. Even such as he, with his lack of talent, can lean upon a technique as a crutch. It is thus in desperation that I have developed this defense and at last rightfully triumphed over him. Should he pass down this empty palm, I can rest at ease knowing that my future disciples reading this manual may oppose his legacy. So, Heart of Twin Stars is a technique in which you divide your core into two parts. And thus, if somebody disables one piece of it with this madra disruption, you will still have a portion of your core to function with. And it will not cause you to go completely, uh, what's the word? Limp is is generally what I'm looking for, but not quite right. It won't render you totally impotent, I guess, is the best way to say it. Um, but it's not like, you know, actually increasing your power. It's basically you're creating a horcrux. So instead of death, it's fighting against being disabled. But the theory behind it is the same. You can like try and kill this piece, but this other piece is still going to be there and you need to deal with that. So I really, I wonder since this person says that like the, their opponent was able to like land an empty palm on them a couple times. I assume that they are functioning under the assumption that if you split your core in two and you get 
to continue to function on the one half of it if you are attacked with empty palm. I guess they're assuming that you will never be attacked, like you won't be attacked again right after, because I assume it renders the, the original intended result. If somebody is able to do two empty palms one after another. I am assuming based on what we see from Lyndon's point of view when he does this technique, that that is a safe assumption because empty palm seems to take a lot of focus and I don't believe that it could be delivered one after another very easily. It's certainly, I bet it's possible, but it doesn't seem like that's something that most people would worry about learning to do because they don't know about the the heart of Twin Stars defense. So, yeah, this is just an interesting thing. So um, here at last, I leave a re record of my journey to split my core in exacting detail. Be sure to follow my path to the very step, lest you suffer a crippling injury from which you cannot recover. So that is really like, that is some deep shit. And it's interesting to me that later on, when Lyndon uses the empty palm technique, Nobody seems to recognize precisely what it is exactly. Um, or if they do, I mean, his father talks about it with him later, but I, I don't know how well known it is. And it doesn't seem like it's used enough that people recognize it right away. The sight of it, you know, um, Andy's commenting, part of the benefit of splitting your core is that your new cores are sitting next to where your single core used to be. So if someone tries to land an empty palm, it won't be where your enemy thinks it is. Your twin cores are basically flanking where your original core was. Oh, okay. So thank you, Andy, for that. I was thinking that it was like, if you get in the general region of where a core is, even if it's, I'm, I'm not thinking that the physical location of your cores matters that much, but because I'm thinking if you land it in the general right place, you're going to be able to reach it. But you're saying, no, it's like divided and put on two separate sides, leaving like a blank spot in the place where your core is supposed to be. So they try and hit it and then just there's nothing. Okay. So I thought it was like, you can take down one, but you have like a backup, but you're saying, oh no, no, we're just getting rid of the target altogether, which uh, I guess the way to deal with that is using two empty palms at once and hitting somebody on both sides of their core, which um, that seems like it would be pretty hard also. Well, I mean, hitting somebody in their core seems like it's difficult enough because later on, Lyndon's dad is kind of like, look, dude, I get that you're high on yourself because that shit worked, but it's not gonna in like a real fight. Nobody's going to just stand there and let you fucking hit them. Like, so. Um, anyway, so he goes to his, to the gardens with his sister, who is going to be training him in order to make sure that he does not disgrace them when it is time for this fight, that it's really disgrace them either for this fight where the, the one that he has been personally challenged to, or in the, uh, the big contest that we see coming up a little bit later. We haven't actually gone to it yet. It is in progress um, of being set up and I'll get to all of that later. So I love this. She says, you seem tired. You didn't sleep well, which will slow your arms recovery. What were you doing? Over the years, he'd found that the fastest way to deal with his sister was to respond immediately and honestly. I love people like that. Let's just get to the point. This is what I live for. I don't like lying. I can lie well if I have to, but I, it takes a lot for me to feel that it's worth doing. <laughs> and if you really do lie well, it takes an inordinate amount of energy to maintain a lie. You have to put energy into displaying emotions that you do not feel. You have to put energy into remembering what the lie was and any sort of like other pieces of your story that come up along the way you have to remember to shape and change and just overall most things i don't feel are really worth lying about like it's it's the kind of thing that there are 
probably going to be a handful of times in my life from here on out that I'm going to feel like that's a necessary thing to do. And otherwise, I'm just like, ugh, tiresome. Don't make me do it. I don't care enough, you know. And I really like the fact that we have this sister. And this sister, by the way, is no... She is, like, very fair, as he has said before. But she is not, like, affectionate. She isn't fair out of a of, of feeling of... <sighs> It's not like they don't respect each other. It's not even like he doesn't like her or she doesn't like him. It's like liking does not matter. You get the sense that she is so bound by duty that if she didn't like her brother, it would not matter at all. You get the sense that she probably does like him like a little bit. But even if she didn't, she'd be behaving this precise same way because he's family and they have a fucking, you know, they have an obligation. They have to do what they have to do. And she doesn't let her personal feelings about a thing interrupt what she intends at all. So I, I really find that interesting because I am more capable than a lot of people at compartmentalizing. but. I would never say that I can divorce how I personally feel about somebody from what I know I have to do. It is just a kind of skill that I, part of me wishes I did have because I am sure there would be big sections of my life that would have been easier had I managed to do that. And yet it is so impersonal and that is just not me. So I feel that if I were able to do that, it would change who I am as a person, like so fundamentally. Um, so she is asking him because he says that he stayed up all night cycling. And it's so funny. Whenever I read this, I know that this book will change what that word means eventually to me in my mind. But any time that he says that, I just picture him in spin class. Like I just keep he says, oh, well, I was cycling. And I just am like, you were. And then I'm like, right, 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 right. Because cycling is basically meditation is what is the vibe I get. And moving chi through your body. And I would imagine through like different meridians and um, pressure points. And, you know, there are in when you are thinking about that kind of uh belief system i guess is the best way to talk about like the idea of chi um or if you're talking about like chakras which is a similar sort of idea in its way it's the the movement of energy through your body and the significance of different parts of your body in relation to that energy and how it's processed or what it means when it sits in a particular place um and he you know had eaten that uh that fruit and is hoping that by continuing to cycle, he will be able to process whatever madra that fruit was able to impart on him. And Kelsa does something interesting where she doesn't exactly tell him what she's doing, but she asks him at one point to please lift a light so that she can read by it because she can't see very well. And He's got, I love his reaction because it's like bright daylight and he looks around and he's like, seriously, are you okay? Do you need the doctor or something? And she's just like, just do it. And he does. And a while passes, uh, almost a full minute. And she's like, okay, you can turn that light off. How do you feel? And he's like, I feel fine. What do you mean? And she's like, you kept that light going for about 52 seconds. How long were you normally able to keep that light going? Because it was a, it's a magical light. And he's like, oh, well, normally like 30 seconds max. And she's like, yeah, see, this is what I'm talking about. And she says that she also noticed that she just has more stamina. And she's, I think, kind of impressed because she, I think she expected this fruit to feel like it was interfering a little bit more. And instead, it seems to be uh, so seamlessly absorbed 
by each of their bodies that they don't notice the difference that it's making in their performance until they really stop and calculate it, which is kind of cool. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, that is the kind of thing that I would think they would be watching out for. But like I said, they have never come across a fruit like this before. They don't have a clear idea of what to expect regarding its effects. So they're just sort of flying by the seat of their pants here. Um, but amongst that conversation is the talk about what he is supposed to do in regard to the Mon family, whom he is, whose tiny daughter they're, he's supposed to fight. His, their 10-year-old daughter, who, by the way, is out for fucking blood. This little bitch is ready to cut somebody. She cannot wait. He is about to, like, fight her. And and she is practically, like, spitting and growling with her family holding her back. She is so excited about it. And honestly, I am fucking here for it. And I love her. She sounds like she's going to be a nightmare. But, like, girl, get it. You know what? Good for you. Um, But his sister tells him, I suggest you fight the girl for a while and then concede. Because either way... You are going to like, there's no way of coming out of this that looks good. If you win, you're going to be shamed because you're going to have like hurt a 10 year old girl. If you lose, you lost to a 10 year old girl. You're kind of fucked. So if you concede and say that you aren't even worthy to fight someone from their family, you'll keep them from losing face. And while it will embarrass you for a minute, eventually your reputation will improve because people will think that you like had honor, that you know your place is the implied thing. Um, you have handled the duel with grace and accepted defeat with dignity. And Lyndon is a little bit surprised by her by his own reaction to her advice. He didn't think that his pride was a particular problem. But the suggestion that he essentially tell that family, I'm worth less than you and I don't even deserve to fight someone from your clan or your family. He just doesn't want to do it. And I'm not mad at him for that. Like mm, he Lyndon takes and swallows a lot of abuse and does it really for the most part with an uncommon amount of understanding and fortitude. I feel like you can only get pushed so far before you just really, it's you're asking too much. Um, so she finally, when she sees him not really respond to her advice, she asks him if he has any idea what he should do. She's basically like, all right, well, you said you're recycling and stuff. Do you have any plan? And he brings out the uh, manual and tells her about using the technique. Um, at first, she, she thinks that he means the splitting of the cores, but then she realizes he means empty palm. And what follows is a sort of hilarious, like, team up between the two of them. Kelsa is absolutely game to do this, but she's game in a way that's pretty brutal. And she does not care that what she has to do in order to figure out the technique behind this is like level poor Linden. This poor bastard is just not ready. <laughs> so... He said she says that she needs a living target with a functioning core if she wants um if she wants to try out these techniques and figure it out. Uh he says you can disable my spirit but it won't do much. I can hardly defend myself to begin with. And she says that's not what I mean. The manual mentions that he had to achieve purity for the technique to work. We don't have time for that. So I'll be pushing my madra into your core until I get a feel for the technique. And it says, as a sacred artist on the path of the white fox, Kelsa cultivated aspects of dreams and light bent towards the purpose of deceiving enemies. 
accepting it directly into his core meant. And immediately Lyndon stops. And I was like, it means what? I wasn't totally sure what this would, what this looked like that would make him step away from her and be like, mm, maybe not. As soon as he tries to be like, ah, I could do it on you. She's like, no, 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 no. You don't even know how to do this stuff. I need to figure it out first and then explain to you because you don't have a frame of reference. And he's trying to say, well, but before and, and before he can even like finish the first syllable, she has struck her palm against his core. And it's like a weird moment because it, she doesn't do it hard. And the strike, there's no like pain behind it. But everything around him goes bonkers. And we find out later it hasn't really. It's the appearance of everything going bonkers because of her madra and what it does. But he basically goes on like a very brief acid trip. It's, you know, there are, it's as the soft bl blue cloud bell flowers at his feet took flight, flapping around his eyes. Shadows in the bushes flickered and giggled. I don't like that at all. While the clouds zoomed around like zealous fish in the ocean of the sky, grass tickled his feet through his shoes and he tiptoed around to avoid it. The ground must not have liked that because it finally had enough and slapped him on the back of the head. He came to in a wrench of returning sensation, lying flat on his back in the garden and staring up into the sky. His arm had begun to ache again. And Kelsa is standing over him when he comes up out of this. And she's just like, huh, yeah, that wasn't fast enough. I think I'm going to have to try it again. And he's trying to tell her, girl, I don't know if I can take another one of those. And she's just like, and hits him again. She does this shit 11 times, 11 more times. And this poor guy is like ready to fucking walk into walls like a cat that had its whiskers cut off. Like he does not know which way is up. He is a uh, fucked up and it winds up eventually wearing off. But like for a minute, it's really, really bad. I just I felt for Lyndon. She's trying to help him, but she's trying to help their family as well. It's not really about him. And so there's a part of me that is like grateful and. I understand that sometimes you just have to push through something that's uncomfortable and difficult in order to make it through to the other side. But there is a part of me that's like, damn, girl, you could have been a little bit chill about it. You know, you could have, you could have given him a rest. And she like does give him a rest at one point, but she clearly begrudges him that. Um, and this moment when he says at one point that he's not standing up again. She just says, then you'll be worthless for the rest of your life. And he's just like, fuck, okay, Jesus Christ. Like, she's not saying it to be mean. She's just trying to be like, your choice, buddy. If that's what you want, then you can choose it. But that's up to you. Um. So then she explains to him, rally yourself, step forward and shove in one motion, focusing Madra in your palm. Release it in one breath like a gust of wind, being sure to exhale and cycle to the rest of your body for stability. Um, and this is when they have the conversation about the fruit affecting his light. Uh, and Lyndon snapped into action as he would for a real sacred arts master. He stepped forward and pivoted at the hips, launching a palm strike at his sister's stomach. Synced with his madra, it should have driven energy through her core like a steel spike, but it splashed like a cup of water instead. One gust, not a breeze, Kelsa barked again. His head was already light and his limbs weak, but he tried until he passed out. When he woke, he tried again. You know what, Lyndon? You're a real MVP, buddy. Really trying to take one for the team here. Um, so a few days later, they have their showdown with the Mon family. And I love this moment where the first elder has to do the thing like, is there no way to resolve this dispute without resorting to, you know, and the little girl's like, no, fuck you. 
<laughs> she's just like she is here to fight. Um, but then Lyndon does something that nobody expects, and he goes up to Keth, the father of uh, what's his name? Tyrrell, Tyrrell. Fuck, I forgot his name. Um, but his son is the you know little shit that ran away in the woods and Lyndon goes up to him and says, I would like to challenge a different member of the family. You. And he expected, I love this. He had somewhat expected gasps from the surrounding families or at least derisive laughter, but the crowd reacted with utter silence. A foundation artist challenging an iron wasn't interesting gossip. It was like an infant trying to bite a tiger. And I really love that. It's like not <gasps> gasp. I can't believe that he it's more like somebody's going, oh, my God, get him away from what are you doing? Is nobody watching him? Fuck. And his the the challenge is looking at him for a minute and he doesn't just go, are you fucking high right now? Are you still on your acid trip, buddy? He's like. Explain. He wants to know the idea behind this. And I really love Terrace. That is his name. I need to remember that. Like a Terrace is like a, like a patio. I'm trying to remember that. Um, but the way Lyndon explains it is in the woods, when Terrace ran away, he had been faced by an opponent that was like several levels higher than him. And it is not f a fair comparison that my my bravery be compared to his bravery. If I'm just going to go up against a 10-year-old, that's not really going to be proportionate. So I should go up against somebody who is as dangerous to me as that tree revenant was to him. And... Everybody around seems to think that this makes sense. I love the detail of Lyndon and his sister having like concocted this plan together. And the father, Keth, says, this is a better way to, uh, this is a better way to demonstrate courage. What terms would you accept? And this is Keth being honorable in letting Lyndon set the terms, even though as the challenged one, Keth really traditionally would be the one to set the terms, but he recognizes that Lyndon is far weaker than him. And if he doesn't allow Lyndon to set the terms, any victory won't necessarily have the same like sheen to it. Everything about the way the society works in this book is very predicated on impressions. It's all about PR. Everything is how does it look? What does it seem like? The truth of things is very incidental to what's actually happening. And that's part of the problem, you know, when uh Lyndon's sister suggests that he just like event he he fight the girl for a little bit but then give up. He's like, I mean, I could do that and probably my reputation would improve a little bit, but it would still be seen as a bit of a weakness. And somebody is always ready to exploit any little bit of weakness, no matter how small it is. So there's a part of him that obviously it's just his personal pride that chafes at the idea. But it's more than that as well. It's the knowledge that perceived weakness is actual weakness in a world that works this way. And this this theme comes up a ton just the idea of like not wanting to let anyone see a vulnerability it's one of those things that makes a lot of sense in its way but is also extremely toxic because then all you ever do is behave according to perceptions of others and that is just no way to live your life. Like that. It's just one of those things that as somebody who has only recently 
begin to really realize how much of what of the choices I made in my life were determined by other people's opinion of my choices rather than what I actually wanted. It's a startling and sobering revelation to have, especially when you are a person like me who sort of prided themselves on doing something without caring what people thought. I always thought I was not in not inhibited by that sort of thing. To realize that I am and to the, to the degree that I am is alarming. And this society functions that way very openly. This it's not it's not like me with my western upbringing that encourages individuality, that encourages you to do your own thing, find your own way, don't follow the rules, don't color inside the lines. We are really taught differently out here about our individual importance and what like following our dreams. And it is a very different thing in a community like this where the whole is what is more important. You are meant to work together to raise the entire family up. And thus, anything that you do that does not achieve that or achieves the opposite is affecting a crowd full of people. And thus, no decision you make is ever really your decision. It's always a family decision. And it's easy to sort of chafe at that idea when you are raised as I was, where what is best for you is really the primary concern. And what is best for the family, if a family is trying to keep you from doing something that is important to you, we see that as being unfair of the family. We see that as being, you know, a family that does not understand you or is uh, oppressing you even in some ways. Whereas they see it as, why would you want to do something that weakens your family? You are a part of it. It's like a being an, uh, like one piece of an organism. And I really wonder how I would be different if I were raised in a way that that sort of thing was more encouraged thinking about things in that way versus the way that I have been. Because while I understand overall the feeling of being completely like a, uh, inhibited by your family, being forced to maybe get a career that you're not that interested in or marry somebody that you're not that interested in, there's also something to be said for the fact that like caring about your community might help us avoid the effects of horrifying rampant self-interest that leads to the kind of like capitalism that we have going on now where people like hoard money and do not give a shit about others who are dying and destitute. Maybe. I don't know. It might not. Because later on, we see that like resources in this community are given to those who are already strong. So, you know, it's, it's really, it's a tough call. What I'm saying is it's tempting as a Westerner to think that prioritizing an individual over a community is the right way, is better. And I don't think it's that simple. Both of them come with really huge cons. And I think they're like anything, it's a balance. You have to figure out how to take care of yourself while still being cognizant of the fact that you are sharing this planet with other people. And that is just a hard thing to get right. It just is, you know. Um, so anyway, Lyndon tells Keth, one strike uh, first you take one strike from this one without defense or resistance. Then you strike me in turn. The first to lose his footing is defeated. And Keth looks at him and it's just like, mm, dude, you sure? Cause like, you are not going to get me off my footing. And Lyndon is aware that as far as Keth knows, getting him off his feet is never going to happen. 
And he tries to play that and it says, this one hopes you might hold back when you strike, but at least this one may show that he is not afraid to take a blow. At last, Keth's face lightened as he understood. Linden was giving him a chance to administer a punishment equal to Terrace's, humiliate Linden publicly and remind people of his own strength in one blow. As long as he didn't kill Linden, he would be seen as both strong and merciful, and he would only gain in reputation. Can I admit something here? I know that Kath is from a family that's like in rivalry with Linden's, and I know that his son is a little shit. But I felt genuinely bad for the way this goes, because Keth really is trying to work with Lyndon. Keth is not unreasonable. He's over here just being like, listen, this seems like a real bad idea, and I feel like you're getting the worst end of the stick, but I will hear you out if you want to explain what the fuck you're thinking here. And I respect the hell out of that, you know? It, it, he really does try and and not... He doesn't want to turn his back completely on giving Lyndon another way out of this. And I liked that about him. And I just, I feel bad because Lyndon is cheating. But the thing is, Lyndon is in a position where he can't do anything else. Like, if he doesn't cheat, he can't progress at all so when you aren't given the same tools as everyone else and you find a workaround does that even count as cheating anymore it feels like really it's just leveling the playing field and if somebody who were fully able like if they did this that would be different and i wonder very much if anybody spots him doing what he is doing, because later on his mother catches him burying a fucking jar of hornets. If it's somebody not in his family, what are they going to think about all of this? I feel like it's not going to look good for him. I understand where he's coming from, of course, but there are rules and expectations. And I am concerned that he's going to like get to the point where he sort of outsmarts himself and winds up like backed into a corner, you know? Um, so anyway, he does the uh, empty palm technique on Keth and Keth does not actually take a step backward. And Lyndon is like panicking because he expected to win this via this technique. And he knows that he administered that empty palm perfectly. But if he didn't get Keth to step back, that means that he is still going to have to withstand one of Keth's blows. And Keth might have been ready to hold back before Lyndon played this little trick. But now that he knows that Lyndon did some shit that was a little underhanded, Lyndon knows Keth is not going to restrain himself at all. So Lyndon goes at him again, and he's not supposed to. It's supposed to be one hit, and then you back off. Instead, he goes in again and immediately steps back, bows, and says, you are the victor, because he cheated by taking two shots. He cheated by doing more than that, but that's all anybody else saw. And by immediately capitulating, he sort of completely takes the reins away from Keth, who keeps protesting that he still has to deliver his blow because he is fucking furious. And Keth continuing to press that he should be able to hit Lyndon after Lyndon has, uh, has thrown, he is like, not looking good it looks because nobody else is aware of what it is that Lyndon just did to Keth so all it looks like to everyone else is Keth being like really petty and uh abusing his power over somebody who doesn't have the same kind of ability and talents as he has so overall what Lyndon did is sort of bait Keth into continuing to challenge him in a way that 
just looks bad for Kath. And he, this like kind of confrontation goes on for a minute. And there's a moment in which it really looks like Keth is going to go after Jaron, Lyndon's dad. And th- this is a dope ass moment. The first elder spots Keth about to throw his strike of foxfire and does something that like seems to move Jaron out of the way and puts himself in the path of this strike. But rather than needing to really do anything about the strike itself, he just like deflects it and then brings Keth to his knees and puts stone manacles around his wrists with like uh, barely a movement. And Keth is fighting back and screaming at the guy and he just puts a hand on his head and this dude goes flat knees down into the dirt. and. This dude, the elder, basically sentences him to a month's house arrest is the vibe. He says, isolation training. I imagine that is house house arrest. And this is the first time, clearly, that Lyndon has ever really seen somebody of this kind of power fully utilizing it and is very startled at how this elder has managed to handle the situation with no apparent effort. It's like he barely had to, to he's not worked up a sweat at all. And he has completely subdued this guy. Um, and Lyndon thinks that a lot of this was actually some kind of illusion. And he is just blown away at the levels of illusion that were going on here if so he's not totally sure that's how it was done but overall there's a real impression here of Lyndon realizing that maybe he doesn't know as much as he thought about what people at different levels are capable of doing um so anyway I found that to be very interesting and I would love to see more of that so we get, and I'm down to just under 15 minutes. So I'm really going to have to pick up the pace here. Um, Jaron, his father, comes home and is basically like, you fucking idiot. What are you doing? <sighs> that was fucking really smart, though. That was. <sighs> All right. Good for you. And next time, I know you and your sister plan this shit. You better not leave me out of it. I want to know what's going on. And I really like this. Jaron warmed my heart a little bit here because he was just such a dick. And I was worried that he was going to be really impossible. But Jaron has a lot of potential to grow on me more. So we'll see. Um, And Lyndon, for his part, like has no memory of his father praising him ever. And that is worth everything to him this winds up coming up later as well his mother saying that she's proud of him and this is the first time either of his parents have seemed to approve of anything about him and it's really like means a lot to him clearly um so then he says his father says what do you intend to do for the festival and I liked that he immediately is jumping to the next thing. He's not even still preoccupied with what just happened. He's already looking ahead. Um, and his father tells him when he explains Empty Palm um, that if he says, you're lucky if you had cultivated any aspects at all, it wouldn't have worked so well. And Lyndon is like, I mean, Kelsa tried it on me and she was able to fuck me up real bad. And he's like, well, yeah, she's a copper and you are unsold. So you have no way of stopping her. Her going up against you is not the same as her going up against somebody else who has the same training and ability she has. If she did what you did today on Keth, that would not have done anything. And Lyndon is thrown by this and is like, Come on, there is no way he was standing there totally undefended. She would have managed to do something. And Jaron is like, I'm a little bit worried now because I thought you knew about the advantage you had specifically. And the fact that you aren't even aware how this like technique really works 
means that you got lucky today. <laughs> and and to be fair, Lyndon realizes that too. He has a moment of just like, oh shit, I completely had this backwards. And he did just kind of get lucky. Um, and what his father explains is that because his madra is not, uh, I, he I hesitate to use the word tainted, but that is kind of the implication. His madra because he is uh, not following any specific path and he is not associated with anything like any particular element, his madra is pure, which means that he can affect somebody else's madra in a way that is much more di direct because the effect of it is not mitigated by essentially additives. So it's like the idea of using like 100% alcohol and, you know, pouring that into a bowl of punch versus pouring a bunch of like liqueurs and pucker and whatever into a bowl of punch. The one, yeah, I guess you did something, but who can tell? And the other one, you're like, oh God, what did you do to this? Jesus. It's like just him not having been harvesting from any other sources means that his madra has got no shape to it in particular and so can be molded to cut through whatever the other person is working with really really simply um so yeah he says that there's very little defense against it um and Yours influences his core in a direct sense, in a direct way. Um, and Lyndon hears this and is immediately like, no shit. So this technique is working especially well because I don't have a soul or am unsold. That sounds like a really good thing for me. But his father is immediately like, dude, you cannot rely on this, though. In a fight, nobody's just going to stand there and let you fucking punch him in the gut. Not going to happen. So you're going to have to figure out something else. Um, and Lyndon, like, hears what his dad is saying. But you can tell he's like, mm, I'll figure out a way around that, though. Like, Lyndon has this scrap of hope. And he is somebody who has had to just, like, f function with scraps, really, m in most things. So he is not put off by the idea of having to devise a, a loophole at all um so this leads to um linden going and seeing the uh the first elder and it's a really neat like introduction the first elder's home is done up in a way that all i could think about was the uh mirror room in john wick three that there's like this uh, huge display that they walk through that's called like um, a look at a look at you, something like that. And basically it's a bunch of mirrored rooms and mirrored staircases and there's lots of intense lighting and color so as to make it really difficult to know which direction you're heading in, where another person is in comparison to you. It's like a fun house, but to the nth degree. And that's sort of what's going on here because the first elder works with white fox madra. And so this place is sort of built with that concept in mind so that it is exaggerated. Like everything is made to be less certain and there are more illusions being generated all the time. Um, so he goes and sees the first elder and he tells him, that uh first of all i know what you did <laughs> the first elder eventually is like, and he says hey our whole thing is honor by any means and the elder's like yeah all right fair and then he asks if he can manage to beat the others in the um the big festival can he be given a path and at first the the elder is like absolutely fucking not but he gives like a, a specific reason. And when Lyndon argues with him, he kind of sees Lyndon's point and backs down and agrees. But you will have to really win. So keep that in mind. And we see later that he has placed some 
uh, hornet remnants in a jar under the stage where he's going to compete, ready to attack at his command, which just feels like more like cheating even than the empty palm technique. But we get to, at this point, iteration 110, Cradle, POV, Surreal. Surreal is, I don't know what, alien, angel, future being. I don't know what this bitch is. She has some tech on her that is bonkers. And she is asking herself why she's here. And there's like a real description that is so confusing about, first of all, she calls herself an interdimensional traveler or spy at one point. And you get the impression that she and some other people are uh, in charge of managing these planets like they're gods. Um, and she is coming here to sort of fix a problem that was left behind by somebody named Osriel. Osriel apparently sort of like decided to completely leave his, uh, duties and go on and who knows what he does not do his job is what it comes down to. And so it seems that Suriel has been sent here to fix the mistakes that he has made. Now, the assumption that I'm making here is basically Osriel was meant to be death. And he has been not quite doing that the way he is supposed to. And so Suriel's initial mission is to come in and like, basically cull a bunch of people and she feels real kind of bad about that but knows that if she doesn't it's going to result in the deaths of a lot more so it's either do this now or watch everybody else suffer much more later and she decides to kind of delay having to make this decision by focusing on another smaller problem that is still big enough to matter, but is not big enough that really, if you pressed her, it would totally be valid for her to ignore the other thing. And it is described as an imminent spatial violation. Domination of local inhabitants by an outside power is predetermined to follow. Um, and she sees this marked on the planet. It, with a red star, which represents a crime that was fated to happen. And that is really interesting. Um, we hear a little bit later from uh, Lyndon's mother that she is, but she is suspicious of this family, the Lee family, who seems to have figured out a way to manipulate space. And they all have assumed that, Madra of space is not a thing, but she's beginning to see them sink money into the study of this. And she's like, people don't fund research that hasn't got any legs. So either they're way stupider than I thought, and they're pouring money down the drain, or they know something that we don't know. And I don't like that at all. And I am assuming this imminent violation is going to have something to do with a breakthrough they're making with their like portal that they're trying to create, which, uh, listen, people who don't know what they're doing, messing with like opening doorways and shit. Just what do you, what do you, what's the matter with you? You don't know what the fuck is about to walk through that shit, you idiot. And, you know, granted, if everybody had a mind like mine, we'd never get anywhere because I'm so cautious. That anything that you are taking any risks with, I'm just like, oh my God, are you kidding? No. But seriously, opening like a fucking door in the space time continuum is just idiotic. And honestly, you deserve whatever you get. So I'm not excited about seeing what this looks like. I am excited, but you know what I mean? Um, so Serial 
decides she's going to intervene on this and she makes herself look as human as she can. Uh, she has to turn her bright green hair darker green. She has to make her eyes look more human because they just don't. There's a bunch of the like her appearance that she has to alter and it's very interesting. Um, and I've pretty much covered everything. I didn't really talk about the fight between. Uh, oh, oh, I forgot about Kelsa and her leveling up. This was fun. So I had asked that last episode how do you know when you've leveled up like how do they determine that well it turns out leveling up is like a physical reaction that you have leveling up is like it's like your computer shutting down for an automatic update that you did not agree to and it's just like sorry but uh you got you got too much shit on here and we need to fix this like she drops to her knees and she winds up sweating and eventually like she's got this like uh coating on her and it's mentioned that like your um body is working to purify itself so i am imagining that she's like shitting out of her skin is kind of the way i imagine this because it's all these impurities that are like coming out through her skin and it's wild to me that this is how this works. And I wonder what happens if you're like in the middle of one of these competitions and you level up like the, you know, the seven day festival and you're on the edge of winning. And then this happens to you. I feel like that really, that would suck. Right. And there's also a difference with each person on how long it actually takes for this cycle to finish. So like, Lyndon's dad mentioned something about how he was done within an hour, which is like fairly quick, apparently. Um, and when Kelsa finally manages to get through to the other side, she's able to like pull up a tree and break it into uh, pieces with just like one movement of her thumb. She's super strong now. I'm in love with this idea. It's so weird. Um and they have like a little ceremony and this is when they give her these elixirs that are really valuable. And we get a quote here that's been highlighted according to Kindle 230 times. Resources went to strengthen those who were already strong, not to bring up the weak. <sighs> Fucking hashtag true. It's like rich people in Hollywood getting these like ridiculous gift bags when they go to the Academy Awards that like. You can buy anything you want. You have more money than God. But sure, give them a gift bag that's worth $26,000 that has an Hermes scarf and a Cartier watch in it. It's not like that money isn't life-changing to the average American. But yeah, whatever. Just give it to them. Ugh, disgusted. Um, so I pretty much have covered, yeah, and talked about him getting the uh, the Hornets, which is a fun well, idea. I really wonder what people are going to make of that technique. I love the fact that he thinks his mother is going to freak out when she finds him digging this hole. And instead, she's just kind of like, look, you're in a tough spot. And I got to admit, in order to get through any of this, you're going to have to do some unorthodox shit. So you know what? Go ahead. And also, I should mention that there's a description after of the seven year festival that is clearly like from the whatever archive of information serial is using and it, the seven year festival feels to me like the olympics where everybody who hosts like make sure that their town is like clean and organized and all of their infrastructure is up to date and it's like a huge honor but also like a lot of pressure to host and it's meant to like bring everybody together but it's also meant to be a competition in a way that it wasn't really intended to be initially and there's a ton of like pomp and circumstance around it and those who are uh you know ranked higher come in on these like ridiculous like palanquins and you know wearing all of these jewels and there's performers it sounds like quite a fucking thing so i am interested in finding out what happens here i i i am into this book i will say it i am into it i i do not know what's going to happen there's like enough of an unfamiliar edge to the way the story works 
that I don't feel confident in any of the predictions that I might make otherwise, you know. So I'm going to wrap up, but thank you very much to Andrew for commissioning this episode. And I believe I have another one just tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. Um, because Andrew um, paid for this book up front so that I would be able to cover the whole thing pretty quickly. And uh, let's see. Yeah. No. Today is the 13th. The next one's the 15th thir um, Friday. Cool, cool, cool. So Friday at 6 p.m. will be the next one. Yay. All right. Oh, sorry. I didn't see. Andrew said, you have the idea of cycling correct. Core equals dan Dantian. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Dantian. Madra equals Chi. Madra channels equals meridians. Cool. Acid trip is a great description. That's all I could think. Um, all right, guys. Well, I will see you on Friday. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs>